out, this is boot camp. This is not a rah-rah session. Now, we're going to have a good time. We're going to create it, but you're going to have to bring that energy to it. You and I together over these five days can create greater changes than you've ever made, not only in your business. What I want you to get is your business is yourself. If you're the leader, I'm here to tell you right now, the chokehold on your business is one of two things. It's the psychology and skills of the leader, always. I will show you no exceptions, and right now it sounds like an exaggeration. And by the end of today, within a few days, people will stand up and you'll see where the chokehold is. As easily as I see it, because I'm going to teach you. And it'll be much easier to see in other people than to see in ourselves. 80% of success is psychology, 20% is mechanics. And when you go to a business and see why is it not growing, or it's growing slowly versus its potential, what's the chokehold? It's the psychology and skill set of that owner. The psychology, we're going to spend 75% of our time on today, and our first break is 7 p.m. Today, you need a business map. A map shows you the territory, so you can say, here's where I am, here's where I want to go. The map is only valuable if you know where you want to go and you know where you are. If you know where you want to go, but you lie to yourself about where you are to try to make it better than it is, you're never going to get there. Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say, I. Your trajectory will be completely off. So we got to know where we really are. And so we're going to start that process here before we go to dinner by asking a few of those five questions I mentioned earlier. And the first one we'll be tacking into in a few moments is, what business are you in? And then what business are you really in? Because many of you, when you describe your business, you do it in a way that makes people's brains shut off. I'm a lawyer. I'm an accountant. I do this for businesses, for building bu buildings, whatever the hell it is. You don't get into state, neither does anyone else. We want to change it so every time you talk about the business, there's an energy in you and there's a curiosity and energy in other people that'll pull much larger people into you instead of a tiny amount that are already looking for what you're after. So different game. We're going to also ask the question, what business do you need to be in? Because that's the question that changed Apple Computer and made it the most successful company on earth. One question that no one else had asked before Steve came along. All right? So we're going to do that. We're going to figure out where we are. Then what do we learn that all business is? According to Peter Drucker, he said it was two things. He said, number one, it's what? Nice and loud. What is it? Everybody, what is it? What is innovation? It's finding a new, better way to meet your client's need. Little things can be innovations. Don't think of innovation as like a new technology. It could just be a better way to meet people's needs. So the second thing that you've got to focus on, and by the way, you've got to focus on this once a year or consistently throughout the year, which one? But here's the key, key word, strategic, constant and strategic innovation. Some of you innovate all the time. You're innovating so much, you're going broke. You have to ask yourself, does the client care or do you care? Many of you do it because you care and that's what's putting you out of business. So it has to be strategic innovation. It has to be innovation that will absolutely can be done easily, consistently, profitably, meet your customers' needs and make you profitable because you can innovate yourself right out of business. Who knows what I'm talking about here? Say I. So tomorrow I'm going to show you a simple process so innovation won't be this big deal anymore. You'll do it and you'll be able to do it about once every seven weeks with your team and you're going to keep innovating and you're going to make sure it's strategic. World-class strategic marketing. You've got to constantly improve your marketing. USP means the unique selling proposition, but we focus more on VAM and X Factor. VAM is, what is your value added marketing? Here's what I mean by that. 15 years ago, it took four exposures to customers before the average person would respond with interest to an ad. That was the average, four exposures. Does anybody know what the number is today? 16 exposures, 15 years later. Now. The cost between four exposures and 16 is a magnitude that will make or break your business. So we can't afford, most companies can't afford to just throw out ads. In fact, when you're trying to compete on ads today, here's the challenge. If you look around and you see, for example, banner ads, how many of you in this room don't even see them anymore? You look at the page and your brain deliberately just blocks it out. You don't even see, raise your hand if you don't even look at banner ads. Raise your hand nice and high. Keep your hands around, look at the percentage of people that don't look at banner ads. It's about 98%, okay? Probably, unless you're doing something unique in that banner ad to stat out, it's not gonna happen. 
Today, is marketing more difficult or easier? Which one? Which one? Which one? Both. It's easier because it's cheaper. It's more accessible. With social media, it can be extraordinary. It's more difficult because where are ads today? Everywhere, and so we become immune to them. So you have to do something to stand out in a unique way or you just are disappearing. But the most important thing to start with is to understand the best salespeople are not trained, they're found. The best salespeople are not trained, they're found and then trained. So if you have, for example, if you have someone who has an in, who's an introvert, introvert, can they be successful in selling? Can they be, yes or no? Yes, they can. Will they be long-term? No way in a million years. They can push themselves to get out of their comfort zone, but people return to their nature, won't happen. Can you take someone who is, for example, let's say extroverted, constantly communicating and talking, and can, be the success, can they be successful as an accountant? Yes or no? Can they be? Yes, they can. Will they be? No effing way. Not long-term, because the job won't reinforce their nature. So here's what I've done in my organizations, and my former partner, a man named Chet Holmes, who passed away a couple years ago, is the one who taught me this. We changed together probably six of our companies, grew our businesses 25, some of them 100%, with only one change. Here's our change. How many of you have salespeople? Raise your hand. How many got salespeople? Okay, if you don't have salespeople, it's the first thing to take the back page of your action list and go, I'm gonna get them. Because if you don't have sales teams, you're missing one of the pillars of marketing and sales that's critical. And today, you can hire salespeople and have someone else run them. It can, they can live anywhere in the world. They can work on the web. You're crazy if you don't have them. However, if you got salespeople, the quality of your salespeople is everything. And the best way to get quality is to screen like crazy for two core elements. And here's the core elements. I can tell you as a minimum, I'm going to give you the simple answer. I'm going to give you a quality deeper answer if you want it. I'm going to give you a gift if you want to take advantage of it. Here's the first one. You need somebody who can deal with rejection, right? That's obvious. If they can't deal with rejection, it's not gonna work. So you need someone who has a certain amount of ego strength. But you also need somebody who's warm enough that their ego doesn't get in the way of the personal relationship so they don't offend people. You need a certain quality of warmth and a certain quality of persistence that no matter what somebody says, they keep on coming. It doesn't hurt them, right? They have to keep coming. It's not just doing accounting, like I said before. It's having someone who can turn numbers into intelligence, that's the CFO. But whether you get a CFO or not, what I wanna make sure is before you leave here, you're gonna have four hours, and I promise you, you won't be going, oh my God, what time is it? You're gonna be juiced, because it's gonna turn the game into something great. If you're already great with numbers, you're gonna wanna be part of that process, because you're gonna see how to teach it to the people around you, because when a business works, it's not when one person looks at the numbers, it's when multiple people know what those numbers mean. That's really where we want to go. Who's up for that? Say I. The subject we're going to touch on is called optimization and maximization. It is my absolute favorite of all business subjects, and I'm not supposed to do it here. <laughs> and the reason is it's a big subject. It's got a lot of impact. So this is supposed to be part of Business Mastery 2. It is. We do two and a half days on this subject where we don't just talk about it, we do it with your business individually again and again and again. We have people come in and give you feedback on how to improve it. So by the way, who's gonna continue your journey past this first part of Business Mastery here? Say I. Right. Good, so as you can see, I've not held back on anything. And so I'm, to be fair, I'm not gonna be able to give this to you what we do in two and a half days in this process, but I wanna give you enough that for the next nine months between now and Business Mastery 2, optimization blows the doors off of that. Optimization allows you to create growth of 130% like clockwork with smaller changes. But we do them in more areas. But before I teach it to you, I want to share this to you first. The process of optimization is actually not that complex. I could probably teach you the process in an hour. But most people's plans never get implemented. Tell me why. Let's see if you figured out why. Why do people's plans don't get implemented? Why do they fail, have a great strategy, and not make it work? Why? Psychology, why else? Fear, why else? Lack of alignment with the team, it's your plan, it's not their plan, why else?
complexity. What I tell you yesterday, complexity is the enemy of execution. Meaning there's a difference, remember, in mastery. There's three levels of mastery. And most people get stuck at level one and think they're a master. Level one is you've got the cognitive information. You intellectually understand it. Cognitive mastery is very easy to get. It's not always exciting. And if you remember day one, we had to do a lot of cognitive mastery to set up these other days. So that now we can play, we can interact, someone can stand up and we go, okay, who are you? What business are you really in? Where are you in the life cycle? And now we know what to do to help that person individually instead of some generalized answer. But the knowledge is not gonna go anywhere if you don't add level two of mastery, which is emotional mastery. That's where you don't just understand the concept, but you have so much feeling associated to its execution or lack thereof, pain and pleasure that you actually do it, and you do it consistently with at least some piece of it. But if you're gonna have ultimate mastery, you've gotta repeat what you've learned. Not only repeat the cognitive, repeat the emotional until it gets into your nervous system and becomes physical mastery. That's when you don't have to think about it, you just, you just do it. The whole purpose of a business, first of all, to be successful in business, you have to create what kind of client? Satisfied or what? raving fans. So our entire focus of everything we're going to do is to constantly create raving fans and a raving fan culture. What's the difference between just creating raving fans? That's wonderful. But if you have a raving fan culture, that means everyone in your company is obsessed with making sure that your clients are raving fans. Let me give you an idea. Tony Shea at Zappos. His entire business, he will tell you, is driven and focused on this outcome as everything. Building culture is how he built a multi-billion dollar brand. Sold it for a billion dollars, what, five years, six years ago. Bro, it's now owned by Amazon. Now, by the way, if you think about that, Tony Shea's product, is it the cheapest product available, yes or no? No, not even slightly. But he decided what his X Factor is gonna be, and his X Factor was gonna be delivery, making the client so happy. To do that, he couldn't do that himself. He had to not only create raving fans, he created a culture that was obsessed by creating raving fans. Dabbler, in your 30s will be very painful. In your 20s, if you can decide there's some area of life that I wanna really be masterful in, I wanna know more about it, I wanna have more skill, more ability. I always tell people, if you wanna succeed, find some type of person, a client, a customer, a type of person that you wanna serve, somebody that you can fall in love with them. Not fall in love with your product or service, but fall in love with them and then develop the skills to meet all their, their needs, to go beyond what they can imagine. If you do that, if you become a master of anything, finance, photography, emotion, leadership, then if you do that in your 20s, when you hit your 30s, after a decade of refining those skills, you'll be coming into yourself and you'll be able to dominate any profession. You'll be able to enjoy your life at a different level. So I think one thing is don't dabble, be a master. Go deep instead of shallow. Most of our society today is all about the quick hit. It always feels good to start something new, start a new relationship, start a new job. And so many people become dabblers because it's like the sugar high. Everything's, when it's new, who can't be happy in a relationship when it's brand new, right? But if you go deep, if you're one of those people that masters relationship, masters your job, masters your profession, you're gonna be able to write your own ticket when you get in your 30s, 40s, and 50s. And I know if you're in your 20s, 50s sounds like centuries away, but it will come, I promise you, quicker than you think.